Well, good morning. The kids are being dismissed to their classes upstairs, and they're going to have a wonderful time. Teachers have prepared for this morning, and it's going to be a great morning with them. Um, I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, it's been a few months since I've been in the book of James, since we've been in the book of James. But if you would, open your Bibles to James chapter 2, and we'll begin reading there. Please pray for the other pastors as they're out of town. Some are visiting. Uh, Pastor Mike is away uh, speaking at a youth conference. So be in, uh, pray for him. He should be coming back tomorrow. So uh, the other guys are on vacation and kind of uh, just visiting family. It's, it's nice to have uh, enough pastors on staff to where we can cover those things and be able to be in other parts of ministry uh, not just here at the church. So it's a, I, I'm excited again to be here this morning. And let's begin reading chapter 2 of James, verse number 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, Without giving them the things that are needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this passage this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just give me clarity. Help us as we go through this. I pray that we would be attentive to your word that you would be at work in our hearts. Lord, help us as we discuss what true faith looks like. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we know if we have a genuine saving faith? How do we know if we have a right faith in Christ? In his letter, James has been writing to, to the fellow believers in Christ, and, and he's given them areas to evaluate. He wants to know, hey, what's your response to these areas that come up in your life? What's your response to trials? Do you break down? Do you trust in the Lord? What about temptation? When that comes into your life, how do you respond? What are the things that you do when that happens? What about hearing and doing the word of God? You, you see what scripture clearly says, and, and maybe you like it or you don't like it, but how do you respond to what God says? How do we treat each other? Do we show partiality? In chapter 2, it got into the, the sin of partiality, how we view other Christians, how we view other people in our pride and our arrogance. Do we show love toward our neighbor? Do we have a mind towards the things of Christ? Or are we way off the mark? And what James wants to do this morning in this passage is he wants to ask a very pointed question. And it's a, it's a conversation about what true faith looks like and what are the characteristics of that faith. Now, beginning here in verse 14, he wants to point out what faith isn't. The things that are not right in a faith. And if you're taking notes this morning, I didn't have time to get them up onto the, the screen this morning, but on your note sheet, the first one is going to be an illusion of faith. What faith isn't. Now, in verse 14... It says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? 
The big question to start this discussion is, what good is it? Literally, is there any benefit to it? To say you have faith and not have any works. Does anyone gain anything from that? The verse is, is really a two-part question. He has the first question, is there any good? What good is it? And can that faith save him? Is it enough? Can a statement of faith alone save someone? Can he claim to know God and know about God and, and have a, an, a mental ascent of God and refuse to live the way that God has described and God has instructed? James points out, that he doesn't have works. He says he has faith, but he doesn't have works. Literally, there's, there's just no evidence. And the word works here can, can be translated as deeds or actions. But does our faith have the corresponding actions? So can a person, as James is asking, make a statement of faith, and that statement of faith change nothing in their life? Is that what genuine faith, what real saving faith looks like? James is wanting to combat this idea of, of a light faith. These believers had come out of Judaism and they're, they're now no longer under the law and they, they look at faith in Christ and some are taking their religious liberties too far. And they're allowing or, or minimizing the necessity of works. They're like, whoa, I don't, I'm no longer under the law. I have faith in Christ, I'm, I'm good. That's all that's required, right? James isn't advocating for a works uh, salvation. I want to I want to make that point very clear. Works cannot save you. They do not make you right before God. They, but once you've come to Christ, they are crucial and they are necessary for your Christian life. In this idea of a light faith, there is less and less of a commitment to the things of Christ, and more and more of an emphasis on well, I believe, I believe in God, I believe in Christ. Isn't that enough? Bible says all we have to do is believe. This is something that we see in so many of the churches today. There was a commentator who remarked on a comic that he saw in a newspaper. And he read, <clears throat> it was a, a picture of a church, a large building, conventional, a uh, billboard out front. And it was advertising its ministries. And it read, The Light Church. And on the billboard it said, 24% fewer commitments. Home of the 7.5% tithe, 15 minute sermons, 45 minute services, worship services. We only have eight commandments, your choice. We only use three spiritual laws, and we're everything that you've wanted in a church and less. And we laugh because it's, it's ironic. There's truth in that. It paints a very real picture of what we see in so many of the churches across the, this country. There's no commitment, there's no conviction, there's no biblical teaching, there's no edification, there's no discipleship, there's no spiritual growth, there's no life-changing faith. And so James's question here would have caused some people to become a little defensive and to object to his statement of like, well, what do you mean, is my faith enough? And James continues here, because he wants to give them an example. In verse 15, it says, if a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food. So in this example, James is referring to other believers, other people in the church. There are people that you sit with in the pews. There are people that are part of the congregation of the church. They, they even do ministry in the church. And you see them, you see that there's a need. It says here that you... Um, that they're poorly clothed. You've taken notice of that. They're lacking in daily food. And maybe something has happened in their life. Maybe they're going through a difficult time. Some calamity has come up. And they're in such a bad situation that they, they can't even afford to feed themselves, to, to take care of their family. And in verse 16, he, he makes this a little more pointed. He goes, okay, here the situation or the example is, you see them, you have a brother and sister in Christ who's in need, and one of you says to them, there's even a conversation. You know, maybe they've shared with you that they're going through a hard time or, or some things in their life are not, are not going well, and your response is, go in peace, be warm and filled. You know, I'm praying for you. Keep trusting the Lord. I hope that he's going to take care of you. 
Now, those are not wrong things to say. We, we should be encouraging people to seek the Lord, to rely on the Lord. We should be praying for other people and mean it when we say we're going to pray for other people. But James is saying that if, if that's your response, just the words, hey, I hope everything's going to work out for you, without giving them the things that are needed for the body, what good is it? Again, going back to the verse 14, is there any benefit? Was there any benefit to you that you said those words? Maybe you feel a little better. You know, hey, I gave him some encouragement. Check that off my list. Did something nice today. Were those people helped by what you said? Were those people helped in their situation by just your words? It's a nice way, as James is putting this, it's a nice way of saying, the Lord be with you, because I surely won't. I, I don't want to be inconvenienced by your problems, but I wish you all the best. I love all the people in this church, but, you know, I've got my own things to take care of. Verse 17, it says, So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Just in the same way that, that your shallow, empty words had no benefit for them. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by works, that faith is dead. If there are no actions, then faith is dead. Now verse 17 is the start of three main statements that James is making regarding faith in this, in this passage. And you see it again in, in verse 20 and also again in verse 26. But James is making the clear distinction that faith apart from works is dead. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He's, in this verse, he's pointing out the inconsistencies of, of, of their response. You, you say you have love towards one another. Going back to chapter 2, you, you say that you care for other people. You say that you care for the poor and the needy. But when you see a need, you turn a blind eye to it. Your, your reaction is different. You think that somebody else is going to take care of it. Well, that's, that's not my job. My job's encouragement. 1 John 3, verses 17 and 18 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. True faith requires that we act. And James is instructing them to examine their lives to see if, if this is the type of faith that they have. This wrong view, this illusion of a faith that is useless, that is dead. Does their faith look like this? Because a false faith offers a false blessing. You know, we feel better because we've said something. We, we were encouraged, or we encouraged someone else. There were some words of encouragement given, but we didn't have to be inconvenienced by doing anything. No time wasted, no, no money was given, no real help was given. James says that if that is your faith, just in the same way that there is no benefit to the people that you give it to, that faith is dead. If all we do is talk and then make excuses when the time comes to act, we may be in spiritual trouble. James, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus warns that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And as James has already said in chapter 1, verse 22, we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if that's our response, if we, if we hear, we know the right response of what we should do, and we say, eh, somebody else will take care of that. We're deceiving ourselves. We have an illusion of faith. We have not, and if that's the case, then we have not, as it says in verse 21 of chapter 1, they have not received the implanted word which is able to save their souls. And as we get to verse 18 of chapter 2, we see that James is, he's already anticipating an objection. Here it comes. He, he knows that somebody is going to say something. So in his anticipation, he, he says, okay, look, someone's going to say it, so I'm just going to say it. 
you have faith and I have works. Now, why does he say it this way? You have faith and I have works. This whole time he's been talking about how he has works and they say they have faith. And I think he's doing this in a way of not really pointing the finger at certain people, but trying to show them like, look, you say what you want to say. The person that he is talking to, this objector, is this, they have this mindset of live and let live. You know what? You, you've got your faith. I've got mine. I'm okay. Yeah, I, I don't need to be proving anything to you. The, these people, they, with this mindset, they have this view of faith and works the way that we view spiritual gifts. They, you know, they say like, oh man, God has gifted you in that area. You just know how to encourage people. You know how to help people. You're always there to help them. You know, God must have given you just the means to help them. That's your spiritual gift. Mine, mine's a little bit different. You know, I take the theological approach. I really like to just really dig deep on an issue. That's my spiritual gift, not in helping other people. And the objection that James is, is trying to combat here is, is this idea of saying, uh, one person says this and another person says that. It's like, you, you can say what you want to say. You have faith and I have works, but it comes down to this. In the end of verse 18, it says, show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. He's not just challenging them. Okay, you, you say you have faith, prove it, show it to me. He's not just challenging them in that regard. What he's doing is he's making a statement that it is impossible to show your faith with just words. If there is nothing to back it up, no action that corresponds with it, and all you say you do is have faith, then you have no way of showing me that you have faith. It can't be done. How will you show me that you have faith? Verse 19, it says, well, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You know, James is now going to this new objection. Well, I have faith in God. I believe in God. That is a good thing. And James is agreeing with it, like, yeah, that, that is a good thing to do. You, you have to have that faith in God. You have to have that belief. Faith begins with a, a fundamental belief in God. But James notes here that even the demons believe. There is no demon that is an atheist. They all believe that God is one. They know who Jesus is. They believe in the Trinity. Their theology is accurate. They know what's going to happen in the end. They know what outcome waits for them in the end. But James is saying, like, that's the bare minimum. A belief in God. You say that you have that? Well, good. But even the demons do. And they're tormented by, that, by their belief. It says here that they shudder. The best description that I could find, or best example, was that they bristle up like a frightened cat. Just that picture, uh, or it paints a picture, is that they know the truth, and they refuse to allow that truth to change them, to do anything in their life to, to turn them toward God, to tor towards truth. A commentator put it this way. He says, if they, being the demons, might hold such a faith and still remain in perdition and eternal punishment, men might hold that same faith and go to perdition. James points out that, that there is a belief that is not a true faith, that is not a right faith. Faith is more than just head knowledge. It involves the heart. It involves action. And as we get to number two, we've looked at what an illusion of faith looks like. And in verse 20, we're going to the second point here. It says uh, it's going to be an, il an illustration of faith. Now, as we continue in the passage, verse 20, James asks another question. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And as we continue here in this verse, James is continuing his response to this invisible objector with another question. 
do you want to be shown? Like, is there something else that I need to do to give you proof? How else would you want me to show this to you? How else can I help you understand this? The use of foolish, it, does, it means more of like an empty person, not really thinking going on. And it also has this idea of they, they have all of the information in front of them, but they still cannot see the truth. They're just blind to the truth. And in that verse 20, it, it does give us the second statement that James makes about faith. The first one in uh, verse 17 is, so faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And now in verse 20, faith apart from works is useless. Now he's referring back to, again, the question he asked in verse 14. What good is it? Where is the benefit? Is there any benefit? And his answer here is no. And it's useless. And he, again, it benefits no one. It's not worth anything. Now, James is still wanting to give an illustration, to give some more proof, a case study, if you will. And he goes on to list two specific people in his list, and he highlights the relationship in their lives of faith and work that they lived out. The first person is Abraham. I read verse 21. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now, if you would, turn over to Genesis chapter 14. I want to look at some context to this. But Genesis chapter 14, and many of us are familiar with this passage and the story. In fact, the majority of the New Testament references Abraham. So, of course, this would be an important place to start. So, an understanding, and these people would have known this as well. They would have known the history behind his, his use of, of this example. But in Genesis chapter 14, there's a, there's a war between the kings all surrounding the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in this, in this time, these, these kings go to war and Lot and his family and all his possessions are taken captive in this battle. And as the, the chapter comes to uh, uh, the middle point here, uh, Abraham gathers 318 of his men to go rescue Lot. And in verse 16 of chapter 14, it says, then he brought back all the possessions. He also brought back his kinsmen, Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. They were successful. God gave them victory and God gave them uh, help during this time of, of rescuing Lot and his family. But then what we see in the next part of the chapter is Abraham, as he's returning back to his land, uh, he's blessed by the, by the priest, Melchizedek. But then as we get to chapter 15, I'm being reading in verse 1, it says, And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, for your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look, look toward heaven, and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So, in, the, in those first verses of chapter 15, it's been 10 years since God has called him out of his own land to go to a land that God would show him. And, and Abraham moved in faith because he believed God. And in chapter 14, we see as life goes on, there are things that go on. God is still providing, and Abraham is still working, is still following God. In, in chapter 15, there is some discouragement. It's been about 10 years, and he has no heir. God has given him this promise that he is going to be a, a people and that he is going to be blessed. And, and he says, well, I don't even have a son. You haven't even given me an heir. And the Lord again encourages him and tells him that he will be blessed and that, that his offspring will be as the stars. And it says that he believed the Lord and it counted it to him 
as righteousness. Now, it'll be another 15 years before we get to chapter 22, but turn over to chapter 22. Abraham is still faithfully following the Lord. He hasn't done it perfectly. There's, there's things that he has tried to take into his own hand. And God comes to him in chapter 22, verse 2, and he asks a special request. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. <coughs> and he gets up early in the morning, verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. Abraham's response was faith. He moved out in faith. He was able to, to keep trusting in the Lord and obeyed what the Lord had said. Sorry, I thought I was going to be able to make it through this one. <coughs> First service was really good. Thanks, Jack. Um, as, we're, as we get to uh, verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning. He, his response was acting in faith. Abraham didn't understand what was going on. And imagine the feelings that he was struggling with, the things that were going through his mind as, as he is struggling with what God has asked him to do. But if you look at verse 5 of chapter 22, it says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. His mindset is already that we're going to go worship and we're coming back. Again, he didn't understand this would have taken three days to get to this mountain that God had instructed him to go. And even with the questions that Isaac brings, he's like, Dad, the, you know, I see the, the fire and the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And even Abraham's response that God would provide himself a lamb, we can see that Abraham was still trusting the Lord, still <clears throat> had faith in the Lord. And we get to see another example of this, Hebrews chapter 11. If we turn over there, Hebrews chapter 11, the, the chapter of faith, or the hall of faith. Chapter 11, verse 17, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. We could see that Abraham had a strong, right faith in God. And as we go back to James chapter 2, verse 22, James is wanting to make that point clear. Verse 22, it says, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. Everybody knew the history of this. They, they knew who Abraham was. They knew the faith that he had in God. And James is saying, you can see by his example that this was a right kind of faith. James, again, is showing that faith and works are inseparable. They work together. And a commentator put it this way, he said, it isn't that faith had to wait for the completion during, during the time that, you know, chapter 15 when it says that Abraham believed God, and then we see in chapter 22 that he acted again in faith. It, it wasn't that it took that long, but that faith that he had in God enabled him to do the proper work. The work that God had called him, whether it was leaving his own country, going and settling in a new land, and then sacrificing his son. If when that test came into his life, when God came to him and said, Abraham, I want you to take your son. And if that faith had not been matched by works, if, if Abraham refused, or if he was like, Lord, I don't understand, why are you doing this? I can't, I can't do this. Like, you, you promised me a son, and now you want me to do this? If the faith had not matched his works, then it would have been proved to be an incomplete faith that he didn't fully trust in God. But because he acted and responded in the way that he did, in the right way, it says it was counted to him as righteous. Read verse 23. It says, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. 
not only was he counted righteous, but he was also called a friend of God. What, a, what an amazing thing to be called a friend of God, to have that kind of a relationship. But that's our reality. For those who have put their faith and trust in Christ, we have, we have more than just friendship. We're heirs in Christ. John 15, verse 14 in Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. And in James 2, verse 24, he's, he's reiterating this, this point about Abraham. We understand, you, you see it perfectly exampled in his life. Here's the proof. That, that a person is justified by works, by the actions that he does, and not by faith alone. So James has made his case of, for Abraham, and, and his audience would agree. They all knew him as, as a, a strong man of faith, is a, is a great example. And maybe James is, is thinking of another objection. Someone thinking like, well, of course you'd pick Abraham. You know, the father of faith. There's so much about him. He's listed so many times in scripture. We can all relate to, you know, Abraham's faith. We all have that strong of faith. But maybe it's, it's that reason that he chooses someone on the opposite end of the moral spectrum. If you look at verse 25, his second illustration, it says, in the same way was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. If you would, turn over to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, and beginning there in verse 1, we see that Joshua sends out two men to go spy out the land uh, in Jericho. And they come to, to Rahab's house, and it says they lodged there. But word gets out that the men of Israel have made it into the city, and the king sends men to go talk to Rahab. And in verse 3 it says, Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you. Who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Now, as she's hiding them, she has an opportunity to talk to them. And in verse 8, we see that conversation that they had. It says, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof, and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, or the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Rahab had a faith in who God was, and it was a right faith. She had a faith that he is the one true God, and she acted on that faith. She put her life in danger to hide these men. She put her family's life in danger. This could have cost her everything, her, her life, her family's life. And she could have said, well, oh yeah, I believe that your God is, is the right God, that he's the, the God of heaven and earth. And then as soon as the guards came, they're like, oh yeah, they're upstairs. You know, for fear of her life even, she could have done that. But her intellectual belief, well, she says here in verse 8, I know that the Lord has given you this land. Like, I know of this God. But her statement in verse 11, that he is the God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. She was moved to act. And as James says back in, back in our passage, uh, James chapter 2, And 
James says that she was justified by her works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. She responded in faith. And we see that Rahab is also mentioned in Hebrews. The chapter, this, this hall of faith, it can also be termed as the hall of works because the men and the people and the women that are, that are listed here gave a listing of the things that they did. By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Moses built an ark. Noah built an ark. <laughs> but you, you see how faith was accompanied with their work. Now, James feels that this example of Abraham and Rahab are, are sufficient. They, they prove the point and the argument that he's trying to make that you cannot separate faith and works. He's shown us what faith isn't. He's shown us what a false faith looks like, saying one thing and doing another. It's not just a head knowledge. Even the demons believe in God. So us saying, like, well, I believe in God, means nothing if we have no actions. And he's shown us the connection, again, between faith and works. How this is the type of faith that it's not dead, it's not useless. This, by these examples, this is true faith. And this faith leads us to follow God. Now, as we get to our, our third point, is an imperative element of faith. What is the crucial part of faith? Verse 26 it says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. In his closing remarks, James is making this third statement of faith. First one in verse 17, that it's faith without works is dead. Verse 20, faith apart from works is useless. Now verse 26, faith apart from works is dead. It's a decaying corpse. That's what you have. If you separate spirit and life from the body, you don't have a, a living being. And in the same way, you cannot separate faith and works or faith and action. Again, salvation is by faith alone. Scripture is very clear on this. Verse 23 of this chapter, it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul mentions the same thing in Galatians chapter 3. He makes the same statement in Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, that Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. We're all familiar with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Even the Philippian jailer, as he's responding to Paul and Silas in the prison, saying, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In Acts 16.31, their response is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. There are many other passages that over and over again point to that fact, that faith, that belief leads to faith. But the accompanying truth is that, yes, salvation is through faith, but the faith is never alone. It is never siloed by itself. True saving faith moves us to an action. In our passage today, James is making that point as clear as he can. Verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Verse, the ending of verse 18, show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Verse 20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Verse 22, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. Verse 24, lost my place. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. I think James is trying to say something about faith and works. James understands what, what real faith is. And it's a faith that works. It's a faith that produces action, action in our lives. 
And James is writing to, to those in the church at his time, but also, also for us in our time, that would say to the, to the pastors or the leadership of the church, hey, don't worry about me. I've got my own faith. Don't, don't bother me with this. I, I'm already a Christian. I've been baptized, catechized, and sanitized from all of the sins. I, I'm doing good. You can, you can leave me alone. My faith is my own private affair. It's between me and God. And what James would say, and if, if, if that's you, if that's your faith, and your faith in Christ has not fundamentally changed you, made you into a new person, those things, those old things are passed away and all things have become new. If that doesn't describe you, then your faith is worthless. There's no benefit to it. There's no benefit to anyone else. It is a dead, lifeless faith. It doesn't matter how often you come to church. It doesn't matter how many verses you can quote. It doesn't matter how versed you are on, on church history. It doesn't matter how well you can debate a theological position. What matters is how we respond to true life-giving faith. And so far, through this book of James, we see that the author is, is pointing us to a singular focused view of Christ. Beginning in chapter 1, we see that there's a focused view of Christ in our trials. How do we view Christ in those trials? Do we run to him? Do we, do we lean into him? What about a focused view of Christ in the times of temptation? Later in that chapter of 1, a focused view of Christ as we hear and do what the word of God instructs. Do we have the right response? Are we following what God has instructed? Or do we, I don't like that. I'm not going to do that one. I don't think that applies to me. Do we have a focused view of Christ as we interact with our neighbors? As in chapter 2, do we show love to our neighbors and do we have a focused view of Christ as faith moves us to action, moves us to work? Without this focus on Christ, we're just like the double-minded man in chapter 1. We're unstable in all of our ways. And just as our faith is shown in our actions, God's perfect example was shown in his act of redemption. He showed his love to an undeserving people. A few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Jason Mills uh, took us through John 3.16, and he highlighted the immense love of God. But what if God, in proclaiming his love, he said basically, well, I hope things work out for you. And you guys messed up, but I'll be thinking of you. Be warm and filled without offering what he did. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The action of God's love was the giving of his only son, so that we would have eternal life. Faith starts, or requires, action. Without it, that faith is dead. So what is our response? What is, how do we put this into action? How do we live this out in our lives? And I want to focus on, on this one main statement. A true, right, saving faith in God must move us to action. Do we truly know God? Do we truly know who God is? Do we have faith in the wisdom of God? Well, if we do, we should be pursuing wisdom. We should be seeking it. James says, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. He gives to all men liberally. We have his word, and it says that scripture gives us all things needed for life and godliness. Do we have faith in the love of God? Do we truly understand the love of God in our own lives? Understanding that we deserved to die in our sin. That there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no one who seeks after God. There was no one who does good. And if we understand that, how do we show the love of God to others? Do we help those in need? Do we care for our neighbors? Are we patient and kind? Do we treat each other without partiality? What about faith in the peace of God? Do we know the true peace of God? Do we have that in our life? 
When everything around you is falling apart, do you have the faith that, uh, that's in God, that you can find peace that passes all understanding? And if we do, do we lean into that faith? Do we trust in him more? Because that's where hope is found. That's where love is found. And that's where true, lasting joy is found, is in him. What about faith in the mercy of God? Have we responded to his mercy? Have we responded to his forgiveness in our lives? Have you repented from your sin and believed in him as the only way of salvation? Acts 4 verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There was a couple of commentaries that wrote about a man uh, famous in church history, John Wesley. He was the founder of the Methodist Church. He went to Oxford Seminary for five years, and then he became the minister of the Church of England, where he served there for about 10 years. He was very disciplined in his devotional life, got up at 4 a.m., prayed and read his Bible for hours before going to the prisons and the hospitals to minister to the neediest people. He memorized most of the Greek New Testament, and later he became a missionary to the, Englands in Amer- to the Indians in America. And he even slept on the dirt to increase his merit and hopefully be accepted to God. He was largely a failure in ministry. And on his trip to America, there was a a great storm and the waves were crashing all around and it seemed like the boat was ready to sink. But Wesley, lacking assurance of his salvation, was terrified that he was going to die. And despite all of his good works, death was a frightening question mark to him. On the other side of the ship, he heard a group of men that were singing hymns and he asked them, how can you sing when it's possible that you would die this very night? And they replied, If this ship goes down, we will go up to be with the Lord forever. And Wesley wondered how they could know that for certain. Wesley knew that Jesus was the Savior of the world, but he didn't know him as his personal Savior. He thought that the solution was in his works and accomplishments. And after working fruitlessly in his missions work in America, he returned home to England in disgrace. He wandered into a, an informal church service where there was a man who was reading a sermon by Martin Luther. And that sermon just so happened to be talking and explaining that genuine faith is in Christ alone. And as he sat there and listened, he, he realized that he had relied on his works and not on Christ. And that night he wrote in his journal, as the sermon was describing the change of heart that God works, I felt my own heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now the resulting work of John Wesley's ministry is well known. After his conversion, he preached in every place that there was opportunity. They said that he preached over 42,000 sermons, traveled 4,500 miles a year. He rode 60 to 70 miles a day and preached an average of three times a day. And when he was 83, still doing the work, he wrote in his diary, he said, I am a wonder to myself. I am never tired, either with preaching, writing, or traveling. Something changed in his life. Something changed in his ministry. And this was a man that had a true, genuine faith. And it changed him forever. We can't gain God's mercy through acts of righteousness that we've done. To God, they're nothing more than filthy rags. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Faith that is not genuine, that is not a saving faith, it offers nothing in service to man or in obedience to God. But a true, right faith, one that is focused on God, one that, one that believes and acts, it's proven in its costly obedience and its costly service. Let's pray. Dearly Father, Lord, I do thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would Help us as we evaluate our own lives, evaluate our own faith, and is it genuine? 
Father, I pray that you would help us to be honest with ourselves, to, to, take, to take an honest look and ask, do we have a right saving faith? Are we moved to action? And are we living in a right way towards you? Father, I just pray that you would just bless us this week, give us opportunity to share with other people, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.